Hey, welcome back to Dashboard December. I'm so glad you could join me. Today, I'm gonna to show you some of the code in my configuration.yaml file that I leverage in my dashboard. And then we're gonna take a look at the main page of my dashboard in detail, including all the code behind it. Let's get started. If you're just joining us for the first time, this is video two of a multi-part series. Hit that link up there in the cards somewhere for part one. I suggest watching that first and then coming back to this video. But hey, you do you, man. Okay, so first up, code. We'll start in configuration.yaml. I created a whole bunch of groups. Many of them are for lights based on which floor they're on in the house. I use these groups to tell me how many lights are on on each floor. Then I did the same thing for my different outdoor zones, backyard, front yard, and driveway. For those of you that might be wondering, the reason driveway is separate from everything else in my dashboard is because my house is on a corner lot, so the driveway is actually on the side of the house. If your driveway is out front, Feel free to put your driveway lights in the front yard or whatever makes the most sense for you. That's what's great about using Home Assistant, am I right? We all use the same thing, yet no two installations look even close to the same. We all make it our own. Next, I created a group for my home audio zones so that I can easily tell in my dashboard if one of them has been left on. What? Wouldn't you hear it? Well, not if it's one of the outdoor channels or not if the input was left on Plex and nobody is actually playing any music to it. Then we've got security sensors. This group includes a whole bunch of contact sensors as well as some motion sensors. Note that these motion sensors aren't motion sensors like you can order from Amazon. They're virtual motion sensors that are created by Blue Iris and triggered via MQTT when DeepStack identifies a person on that camera. Now, I set them to trigger on people, but you can set them to trigger on whatever you want or to send different triggers for different things, cars, trucks, people, animals, whatever. I made a three-part series all about how to set that up and configure it. So if you're interested in checking that out, make yourself a giant glass of eggnog and find a comfortable chair. That series is pretty in-depth and those videos are not short. There's a link to part one in the description for you. Next, I created a group for my locks so that I can immediately get a count of the number of locks that are in the unlocked state. Then. We're on down to the sensors. The first sensor we need is a guest SSID device count on lines 184 through 186. This gives me a count of how many devices are reporting that they're connected to my Wi-Fi SSID named guest. I use this information to enable or disable various automations based on the presence of guests in my house, like not turning off the entire house if my wife and I leave, but the babysitter's here. I made a whole video about that too. Check the description for a link. Next up is devices with low battery. Line 256 there sets the entities I want to ignore from this list, such as phones and tablets. Line 262 specifies that I want to alert when any devices get below 10% battery. Basically, this sensor says, get the states for all sensors with a device class of battery and ignore the ones that are unavailable. And then the value for this sensor should be the count of devices that meet this criteria. Lines 265 through 270 Set the icon for this sensor so that when you use it on the dashboard, it changes automatically. Next up, we need the high temp sensor. Again, on line 276, I set which sensors to ignore. Then we collect up all the sensors where device class equals temperature, reject the ones in the ignore list, but also reject any of the attributes that contain battery, W leak, magnet, or motion, since I don't want temperatures for those components, and then return a count of the sensors with values greater than 85. After high temp, of course, is low temp. This is pretty much exactly the same as the high temp one, except that line 296 specifies the sensor should be included in the count if the value is less than 55. Line 299 defines a contact sensor for an egress window. This particular window slides sideways instead of up and down, and you can move either side of it. However, because there wasn't room to use a single contact sensor in the middle, like with one piece of the sensor on each of the two sliding portions, like this, I had to use two sensors, one for each pane of the window that can be opened. To make life easier elsewhere at Home Assistant, 
I just defined a sensor in here that says if either one of those two individual contact sensors is open, then that means that the egress window is open. Then I just use this egress window sensor instead of having to evaluate the two contact sensors individually every time. Magic. Now we're out of the sensors that leverage the groups I created above. Why did I choose to do it this way? Because when I want to add something to be monitored or reported on by that sensor, it's much easier to just add it to the group than it is to have a big list of stuff in the actual sensor code. First up, we've got the main floor lights count, followed by the second floor lights count and the basement lights count. These sensors return the number of items in the group that match the specified state in the template code. For lights, I'm just looking for on. After the interior lights, we've got the exterior lights, backyard, front yard, and driveway. Then comes home audio power count, followed by security incident, and finally unlocked doors. Note that the state I'm looking for here is unlocked. Finally, we're down to some binary sensors. I created these, again, for ease of use, and you can see them here on lines 447 through 471. With the exception of the one ping sensor, these are all just threshold sensors that monitor the larger sensors above, and if the value returned by any of those other sensors is above 0.5, then this binary sensor turns on. I've got one for devices with low battery, one to tell me if there's guests connected to my Wi-Fi network, one for the egress window, and one for high temp and low temp alarms. Then that ping sensor that's hiding in there, that tells me if my internet connection is working. It scans every 15 seconds. That's going to do it for the configuration file for this portion of the dashboard. So let's move on to the dashboard itself. Real quick though, if you're enjoying this series, I really would appreciate it if you give that like button a whack. That helps get my thumbnails in front of more eyeballs, which hopefully means more people will watch the videos. And when more people watch them, it helps motivate me to make more and better videos for you guys. So thank you for helping to motivate me. Speaking of help, I do have a Patreon page if you're interested in supporting the channel. What's in it for you? For starters, all the code that we just covered, as well as all the code that I'm going to cover in the future, it's all available on my Patreon page for patrons to download. No pausing the video and typing all this nonsense in. Just download it, copy paste it into your home assistant, change the entity names to match your entities, and you're off to the races. There are many other exclusive benefits from my patrons as well, such as early access to ad-free videos, free t-shirts, access to the FHT Discord, and a whole lot more. Benefits are available starting at just three bucks US per month. I'd like to send a huge thank you to my current patrons. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for your support. Okay, on with the show. Here we've got the main page of my dashboard. I'm not gonna spend any time talking about the logistics of how I decided to break up the house or the navigation since that was covered in the first video. I'm just gonna jump right into it so here we go. Now, one other thing I'm gonna do here though is to copy the code for each page out of the UI and paste it in a notepad. I know that means we lose the pre-colors and the line numbers, but the UI display is not wide enough to show all the code. Since I'm sure those of you who aren't patrons would like to be able to see all the code so that you can pause it and type it in. And since I'm too lazy to scroll left and right 4,000 times during this, we're gonna do it this way, okay? Just go with it. So starting at the top, almost all my dashboard pages begin life as vertical stacks. This helps to keep the buttons aligned the way that I want them when the display size changes. Sometimes part of it might slide off sideways or something on a PC or tablet, so putting everything in a vertical stack helps ensure that it'll look the way that I want it to look. Next up, I use a mushroom template card for the greeting, along with a bit of code that says good morning or good afternoon or whatever else you want to put in there. After that is a horizontal stack. The first item is a mushroom chip that displays the current weather. The next two items are conditional chips, one for garbage and one for recycling. Now, this was originally done using the Bruxy 70 garbage and recycling integration, which has since unfortunately been deprecated. However, the sensors and all that stuff are still in my installation, so I'm gonna continue using it. Now, I've read that you can accomplish the same thing using the native calendar somehow, but since I haven't sat down to figure that out just yet, I don't wanna waste your time teaching you about an integration that I don't think you can even get anymore. So we're gonna skip over all that, aside from me saying that it's totally cool and 
If you have trouble keeping track of, is it recycling week? Like we did, this solution is amazing. If I ever get some free time, maybe I'll try to figure out the calendar version of this and I'll make a video about it for you guys. The next construct on this dashboard page is another horizontal stack. Again, that's how most of my pages are. Horizontal stacks nested inside a vertical stack. Layout control is very important. The first card on this one is main floor. On the main floor, I've got temperature sensors in the kitchen and the parlor. So I display those as secondary text on the template card. Then I use the sensor from the configuration file to tell me if any lights are on. Very important. See how the zero is in quotes? Yeah. That's because sensors store data as strings. So you have to perform a string comparison there, which is why I said, if lights on equals zero, do nothing else. Set the icon color to yellow instead of saying, if lights on is greater than zero, set the icon color to yellow. Greater than is a mathematical comparison, which is a no, no. So I like the look of that vertical layout. So I set it to that and the tap action is to navigate to the main floor view. In order for the temperatures to display correctly, we've also got to set multi-line secondary to true. Next up is code for the second floor cart, which is pretty much identical, except I display the temps for the master bedroom and the nursery and navigation takes you to the second floor view. Then the same for the basement and we're across our first horizontal stack. So next up, of course, is another horizontal stack. The first card on this one is a card for the backyard which also leverages a sensor to change the icon color if lights are left on, followed by a card for the front yard and a card for the driveway. The next horizontal stack starts off with the security card. For this card, I want to change it if there are security incidents, open contact sensors or detected motion, or if there are doors unlocked. So again, because the sensors return string values, the logic here is a little bit convoluted. The first if statement basically says, if there are no incidents anywhere and all the doors are locked, then the icon should be a closed lock. Next is an else if that says, if there are no unlocked doors, then change the icon to a motion sensor, else change it to an open lock. This works because the only way this second if statement would be evaluated is if there was an incident or there was an unlocked door. So now all we have to do is figure out which of these two conditions caused the first if statement to evaluate to false. Now that we've handled setting the icon, we're going to use a similar logical evaluation for color. If conditions are normal, do nothing else. Set the color to red. If you wanted red for locks and orange for contact sensors or motion, you could just use the exact same code I used for the icon and add the additional color in there. The next card in this horizontal stack is the Wi-Fi card, which has no logic. It's just a button to display the Wi-Fi view. The third card on this stack is for home audio, which turns yellow if any of the whole home audio channels are powered on. The final horizontal stack on this page begins with a template card for environment. After I set the icon and the navigation and whatnot, I use those binary sensors we covered for low temp and high temp to control the icon color. Low temp alarm, make it blue. High temp alarm, make it red. After environment is batteries. This card leverages the devices with low battery binary sensor for both the icon and color. If everything is normal, the icon is just a battery with the default color. However, if there's a device with a low battery, change the icon to battery minus 10, which is a low battery and color it red. And finally, the card for my information view. This doesn't do anything special. It just takes you to the information view, man. Finally made it through all that. And guys, that was just the main page view. We've got 34 more views to get through in this series. So be sure to subscribe and smack that bell if you want to be notified when the next Dashboard December video is released. Now, some of you might be wondering, how long does it take to build a dashboard like that? Well, truth is, I have no idea how long it took. I've been adding to it little by little for the past couple of years as I've made changes to my automations and added sensors and devices and whatever. I mean, just before I recorded these videos here, I added two more lights to my office and set up the HA integration and then added them to the dashboard of my office. It is constantly evolving. My hope is that you can take the information that I'm sharing in this series and maybe copy paste out individual pieces of code that'll work for you so that you can have all this cool stuff in a fraction of the time. It took me to dream it up, 
figure it out, debug it, and everything else. Remember, my goal with this channel is not only to make the dumb stuff smart, but also to make the smart stuff easy. Drop me a line in the comments and let me know what you think. Did this video help you out? Am I making it easy enough or am I still too high level? I'm here to produce videos that you guys want to watch. So do me a solid and help get me pointed in that direction. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you liked this episode's t-shirt and I hope that I was able to teach you something new. Thanks for watching and until next time, go automate something, will ya?